All right, let's get started with this week's material. So we're going to talk about something called planar graphs. And these graphs are graphs that you can draw like on a piece of paper. So plane here refers to like the XY plane um, so that edges don't cross. And we're going to see that there are graphs that you can draw on the plane without edges crossing and uh, graphs that you can't. But the difficulty dis is discerning uh, how do you know when you can and when you can't? Okay, so this is the first time we're actually going to be caring about the way we draw graphs on a piece of paper. So again, a graph G is planar if it can be drawn in the plane, like the XY plane, meaning on a piece of paper, so that no edges cross. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So let's start with this graph right over here and ask ourselves whether or not this graph here is planar. Well, you notice that uh, we drew it in the plane without edges crossing. So it is the case uh, that this graph is planar. Okay. Um, well, what about this graph? Well, this graph is actually isomorphic to this one. So you would think the answer should be the same. And it is. Uh, Remember the definition here is that a graph is planar if it can be drawn, me meaning that we can find a different way to draw it so that the edges don't cross. So an example is the drawing we just had of it above. Uh, another example is you could physically try to just draw this so it doesn't cross this edge right over here. So when we say crossing edges, we mean something like this. We have these two edges that actually physically cross when we draw them. All right, so another possible way to establish that this graph is planar is to draw it like this. So we'll say yes, this is indeed planar. Okay, another graph. Let's take this graph right over here, the complete graph on four vertices. It turns out this is planar as well. So one thing you could do is think about moving this vertex or any one of the vertices inside here and so you redraw it with the other three cycle kind of blown up and if we distinguished these right here maybe like this then we can draw the rest of the graph like this now you notice that edges don't cross here and so we're good Okay, um, what about K5? So K5 is a complete graph on five vertices. Well, let's make an attempt. First, we'll draw this outer five cycle, cycle on five vertices. Uh, and then we maybe draw this edge and then this edge. And then we think, for example, if we wanted to draw this edge, we should draw somewhere outside of what we have here. So maybe something like this. And then we can draw this edge right over here to be like this. And then we feel like, well, maybe these other edges are going to be a problem. Right? Well, maybe we could have been a bit more clever and did something like uh, this instead. But then we feel like we're blocked again. So we can try different strategies and one thing we could think is that maybe, okay, we've tried a lot of strategies and we tried to argue and say, well, this is not possible. But the problem is, remember, we can draw edges in a lot of different ways. So for example, if you have two vertices, maybe you draw one edge to look like, well, it shouldn't cross itself, to look like this, and then go off to the moon and come back and then go here, right? So there are a lot of complicated ways to draw graphs which makes it actually difficult to discern when a graph is not planar. If you want to show a graph is planar, you can draw it in the plane. But to establish that a graph is not planar, it's going to take a lot of work because you can't just sort of say, okay, I tried these different things and this has to happen because of the position of these vertices. We don't actually don't know where these vertices um, are forced to be drawn. We can have three of them drawn here and then one of them drawn 
seven kilometers that way, right? And maybe there's a possible way to do this. So one of the things we're going to do is see through the magic of graph theory that we can actually build up properties of these types of graphs uh, in order to determine uh, which ones or rule out ones that are impossible to be planar. And we'll see lots of examples of this um, as we move on. But before doing that, we're going to need a lot of language to describe the different moving parts when we draw a graph in the actual plane. Okay, so I'm going to start with an example of a planar graph that's going to motivate all of our definitions. Now, there are a lot of definitions here. Not a lot of them will be things we use very often, and some of them will have some technical pieces. But the main thing here is I want to make sure we have a language for all of the important parts that we will refer to when dealing with these planar graphs. So this is an example of a planar graph right over here. You notice I drew it without edges crossing. And I'm going to resize this so that it's a little bit larger. And uh, we'll be able to sort of write on it when we need to. Okay. So a planar drawing of a connected graph partitions the plane into regions. So you can kind of see this. Uh, when you draw a planar graph, you have like these little regions in here. And then you have this outside region over here, outside of all of this stuff. These regions have names, they're called faces. Right. One of these regions is unbounded. And so it's called the unbounded face. Okay. So if we we're to write down the faces of this particular planar drawing of this particular graph, I'll label them as uh, F1 here, F maybe F4 here, there's four of them, just F2 here. And uh, actually I'll keep consistent with what I have in my notes. So what I did here is we have F1 as this face, F2 as this face over here, F3 as this face and F4 as this face. Okay, so in our example here, uh, this is actually F2 is the unbounded face, F2 in the example above. Okay, so you notice the vertices and the edges that touch a face all sort of enclose the face in a way. So we're gonna give them names, the vertices and edges incident to a face is called its boundary. Okay, and we say two faces are adjacent. So I'll add a little bit more space here. If they share an edge on their boundary. have a common edge on their boundary. Okay, so what's an example of something like this? So an example is, uh, for instance, this edge here is on the boundary of both F2 and F3. So F2 and F3 are adjacent faces. This is not the only face edge that certifies that they're adjacent. Um, actually, this edge as well is on the boundary of both. So it certifies that they're adjacent as well. And F2, if you look at this edge, F2 is on both sides of it. So F2 is actually adjacent to itself. That's something that's a little bit different um, than we, what we had for uh, 
graphs. So this example, F2 and F3 are adjacent. F2 is adjacent to itself. Okay. Okay, so there's this sort of idea of keeping track of faces and what we'll call their degrees. It, the definition is a little bit pedantic, but let me give you some intuition first. So F4, we're going to say its degree, it has, it, its degree is 3. And same with F1, we'll say its degree is 5. And you sort of notice both of these are bounded by cycles. So you have a, maybe a more intuitive understanding um, of what degree ought to be. And it's the number of edges that are incident to the face, right? Um, so we haven't defined incidence, but you can kind of imagine what that is. The complication will come over here. What to do with something like this. So as one walks around the perimeter of a face, one encounters vertices and edges along its boundary. Okay, so a boundary walk around a face F is among all walks that start and end at the same vertex and visit every vertex and edge of the boundary of F, one with the fewest number of edges. Okay, so this is complicated. So uh, let's look at some examples. So it says, as one walks around the perimeter of a face, one encounters vertices and edges and a boundary. A boundary walk around a face, so you select the face, a boundary walk is a walk that starts and ends at the same vertex and visits everything in the boundary, but also uses as few edges as possible. So for example, in F1, if you start at this vertex and you want to go around and take a walk on this graph that starts and ends at this vertex and uses every edge and vertex in the boundary, then you have to go like this. And you can't do this more efficiently. So this is an example of a boundary walk. Another example is you could start here and go like this. F3 is where we see some relative complication. So you might think you could do this, but however, you'll be excluding the vertex right over here. So a boundary walk in this case will actually have six edges in it. You have to go up, let's say you started here, you go up here, then into this vertex, and then back out to be able to go all the way back to the vertex you started with. And the same thing is going to happen if you start at any other vertex. If you started here, you have to go here, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you started here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So remember, you always end and start at the same vertex. So these boundary walks are going to give us this notion of a degree of a face. The degree of a face is the number of edges in a boundary walk. Okay, so let's tally some of the degrees of the vertices here. So we can kind of see the degree of F4 is three and the degree of F1 is five. So let's actually write that down. So the degree, as an example, the degree of F1 is three, or sorry, degree of F4 is three and the degree of F1 is five. Now, the complication comes with the degree of F3. So the degree of F3 is what? Take a moment and try to recall what this is. And we'll see uh, how to do this. And then also try to do the degree of the, the large face degree of F2, the outer face. 
So if we draw the picture of that face, F3, we saw that it looked like this. And our idea for getting the boundary walk is to go here, then here, then here. Oh, we have to be careful. Then go in, then back out, then down, then up for a degree of six. Okay, and then the degree of F2, we got to do the same thing. Now, the thing with F2, it doesn't include this edge, right? This edge in this particular planar drawing is not on F2. F2 is everything outside. So if we start at a vertex like this one, we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Remember, you always have to start and end at the same vertex and touch all of this stuff on the boundary of that face. So here we'll get a degree of 14. Okay, so there's something curious about these numbers. If we add them up, so here, sum of degrees of the faces, uh, it looks like you get 3, 5, 6, 14, which is 28. And if we look at the number of edges here, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 edges, exactly half that. Okay, so this looks like we have something like the handshake lemma that we had for the relationship between the number of edges in a graph and the number of vertices. Now we seem to have something that happens with the uh, number of edges and the degrees of the faces in a planar drawing of a planar graph. And that phenomenon is not a coincidence. Uh, it's called the handshake lemma as well, and um, it's usually called the face version of it. We won't prove it because the proof is actually really similar, but we'll talk about the ideas of how one would prove it. So if G is a connected planar graph, and F1, F2 through F sub F, so this is F sub little f, are the faces in a planar drawing, then if we add up the degrees of the faces, so that's the sum, now we've enumerated the faces, so we can talk about the sum as going from I equals one to little f, the number of faces, the degree of that face, if we add all those up, we got twice the number of edges. And the proof is similar to the handshake lemma. So again, we won't prove it. Um, but if we go to this previous page, we can get a kind of sense of where it's coming from. So if you look at any edge, let's look at the contribution of that edge to the total degree count of the vertices of the faces, sorry. So you look at an edge like this. Now, since every edge has a face on either side, and the number of edges in a boundary walk is the number, is the degree of a face, then each edge contributes two to the total degree count of the faces, one for the face on one side and one for the face on the other side. So when you add up all the degrees of the faces, you're really counting up the edges twice for every time you contribute to the degree count of the two faces on each side of an edge. Okay, that's great. And this is a cool observation that we'll see later will help us in understanding um, how to find obstructions, like provable obstructions to being a planar graph. Okay, so I want to make some more observations where we look at specific uh, graphs and look at planar drawings of those graphs and make a tally of the number of vertices, edges, and faces in that particular planar drawing. 
Okay. So let's start with this graph right over here. Okay, then I'll take a graph like this. If you recall, these graphs, a graph of this type is called a tree. It's a connected graph with no cycles. And I'll take this graph right over here. And then I'll take one more graph that looks like this. Maybe I'll even add this in. Okay, so you might think, uh, well, this doesn't look planar, but it is planar. You can take this edge and write it out here. Right, it doesn't have to be in that fashion. Okay, so let's quickly record the number of vertices and edges in each. So here we have five vertices, here we have one, two, three, seven vertices, here we have uh, six vertices, and we have six vertices in this one. Okay, edges, we have five edges in this first one. We have, uh, since this is a tree on seven vertices, it's forced to have six edges. Uh, the next graph we can count has six edges as well. And this other graph, we'll do manually. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, now let's look at the number of faces in a planar drawing. So for the first graph, we have this inner face and this outer face for a total of two. Okay, and then uh, in this tree, well, the tree will only have the outer face because it has no cycles. So it's one. Okay, and then this next graph, we have two faces, an inner and an outer. This last graph, well, we haven't drawn it in the plane without edges crossing. So let's do that first, um, and then we'll be able to uh, discern the count. So it'll look something like uh, this is an example of a planar drawing. Okay, and here we'll see we have one, two, three, four, five. Five faces in that planar drawing. Now there's something interesting and seemingly magical that happens with these numbers. If we take a look at this column, over here and add this column what do you get you get seven for the first one eight eight and eleven and these numbers happen to be exactly two more than this right so seven is two more than five eight is two more than six eight is two more than six, and 11 is two more than nine. And this happens for any connected planar graph. We'll state as a conjecture, but it'll turn out to be true. So if G is a connected planar graph with this many vertices, this many edges, and this many faces in a particular planar drawing, then there's a formula for F. It is uh, the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus two. This is kind of magical. And we usually write it in the following way. Instead of writing it as a formula for the faces in terms of the number of vertices and edges, we usually write it like this. V minus e plus F equals two. So we're going to prove this phenomenon in a little bit, but I want to make some comments about this because it's actually really quite interesting. So first of all, one of the things that's magical about this is if you have a graph that happens to be planar, meaning you can draw it in a plane without edges crossing, and this graph may have, oh, who knows how many vertices and edges, maybe it has like 500 vertices and 700 edges. So there may be many, many, many different complicated drawings of it in the plane without edges crossing. However, this tells you that no matter which way you do this, the number of faces in that drawing is static. It's always equal to this formula right over here, which is kind of a wonderful thing that you wouldn't necessarily expect beforehand. How would you know that? And having that knowledge will help us in getting some uh, building restrictions to knowing whether or not graphs are particularly planar. Okay, another thing is we actually know this formula 
for a specific class of connected graphs. And that class is trees. So let's see why we know this. So if, so note, we know this for trees. If G is a tree on V vertices, then the number of edges is V minus one. We proved this a few classes ago. Now it has no cycles. Um, so uh, a tree has no cycles. So in any planar drawing, you only have the outer face. Okay, so if we tally this all together, V minus E plus F is V minus the quantity V minus one because it's V minus one edges, plus one because it's one face, which is two. Okay, cool. So we actually know what's going on with trees. Now the question is what happens with other planar graphs that are not necessarily trees. Okay, so I'll make one last comment about this. There's kind of a cool thing that's happening with this formula when it's written in this form. If you think about this from the perspective of something geometric, which is usually not how we think about graphs whatsoever, but bear with me for a moment. Vertices are like zero dimensional things, they're just points. Edges are like usually written as these line segments. And so they're one dimensional and faces are like two dimensional things, right? So it seems like what's happening here is like we're alternating on the left-hand side, dimensions of these objects and the total sum when we alternate is uh, equal to two, right? So another way to think about this thing is like negative one to the zero times the number of vertices, that's the zero dimensional stuff. You add in negative one to the one times the number of uh, one dimensional stuff and add negative one to the two times the number of two dimensional stuff and that equals two. This is the beginning of a very, very, very lovely subject area where you generalize this type of computation uh, to uh, settings well beyond what happens in this course. Right? And this area of mathematics that discusses these types of things is called topology. In particular, you learn a lot about this type of stuff in a course uh, called algebraic topology. Anyway, we don't need to talk about that specifically, it's just sort of, sort of for your own interests. But now we have this formula that relates vertices, edges, and faces for planar graphs, but we need to know why it holds. So the next thing and the remaining thing for uh, this video is why this particular formula holds for all planar graphs. So this formula is actually due to uh, the mathematician Euler. And it says the following, suppose G is a connected planar graph with V vertices, E edges, and let F be the number of faces in a planar drawing. Then we have this particular relationship. So we're gonna actually prove this inductively, but it's gonna be a kind of strange induction. Not that the process of induction is strange, but that we're gonna fix one part of the graph and then induct on another part. Right, so in this proof, we're going to fix the number of vertices, right? So the number of vertices might be something like seven, and then we'll induct on the number of edges. Okay, so I want to mention something here because it's a little bit sensitive. Usually in the course, we've used V to revert, rev, 
use the variable v to refer to a vertex in the graph and the variable e to refer to an edge in the graph. Now we're actually using these variables to count the number of vertices and edges. So let's be careful with that. So here, v is a number of vertices, e is a number of edges. So we're fixing v and we're inducting on e, right? That is the, that is the goal. Okay. Okay, so base case, what is the base case? Well, you might think the base case is something like E equals one, we're inducting on E. But unfortunately, that's not true, right? So if you had a graph, let's say you had a graph V on, uh, we're fixing V here. So let's say you had a graph V on four vertices, um, and then you sel select E to be one. Well, this is actually not a connected planar graph. Right, so we need to know what the smallest number of edges a connected planar, a connected graph can have um, if it had specifically V vertices. Okay, and we can actually discern what this is. So, um, since any graph on V vertices that is connected has a spanning tree and that tree as V minus one edges, because it's a tree on V vertices, E is going to be at least V minus one. Right, if a tree on V vertices is, this, the, the, sorry, you have a graph on V vertices that's connected, is gonna have a spanning tree because it's connected. So uh, it has at least V minus one edges. Okay. So the base case is E equal to V minus one. Of course, here you have to know whether or not there are graphs on V vertices with V minus one edges that are connected, but actually trees um, are examples of those. Okay, so We'll start with this base case. Suppose E is V minus one. Then we want to see what happens if a connected planar graph on V vertices and V minus one edges. So first we're going to actually prove that this thing has to be a tree. Okay. Let T be a spanning tree of G. Okay, then, well, it's a spanning tree. So the number of vertices in the tree is the same as the number of vertices in G, which is V. And at the same time, since T is a tree, uh, the number of edges in it is the number of vertices minus one. Okay, but the number of edges in your original graph is also V minus one, right? So if you look at this, T is a spanning tree of G that's a subgraph of G that has the same number of vertices and edges as T itself. That means they're actually the same graph. So T is a subgraph of G with the same number of vertices and edges as T, as G, sorry. 
So T is G. Okay. So that means G itself is a tree. So what's going on here? This is kind of confusing. So we start off with saying if you're a, we're fixing V and we're trying to induct on E one of the base cases, the base case is E equal to V minus one because any connected graph on V vertices has to have at least V minus one edges because it has a spanning tree in it. So now we take this base case and we ask ourselves what to do with it. So suppose you have, you are in the situation of the base case, we have to prove this formula for the base case. And what we've done is we've argued that if it's the case that E has V minus one edges and V vertices and is a connected planar graph is forced to actually be a tree. Right? Okay. The benefit of that is if we're trying to figure out what happens with this formula, well, now we know G is a tree. We have this part, it's the number of vertices that was given to us. The number of edges we have in terms of the number of vertices, but now because we know it's a tree, we know in a planar drawing that um, it has exactly one face. So since G is a tree, it has no cycles. So the number of faces is one in any planar drawing of it. Okay, so now we can compute this entire thing, V minus E plus F is V minus the number of vertices, number of edges, which is V minus one because it's a tree. And then we have one, which gives us two. This may be the most complicated base case of an induction proof you may have seen, right? A lot of inductive proofs, you just sort of start with V equals zero, V equals one or something like that for the base case. But here, you can't do that because if you have like nine vertices, for example, and you're inducting on the number of edges, but you're still a connected planar graph, um, you can't have fewer than eight edges. Nine vertices, you can have fewer than eight edges uh, if you're connected in planar. Okay, but that takes care of the base case. So let's now go ahead and look at the inductive step. So for the inductive step, we're going to do the same type of thing we've done in inductive proofs before. You're given a graph G that satisfies these assumptions. So it's a connected planar graph with V vertices and E edges and F faces. And we want to prove that this is true. And we'll assume it's true for all connected planar graphs on the same number of vertices because we're fixing that, but with fewer edges than the one that we're given. So suppose the theorem is true for connected planar graphs on this fixed number of vertices and fewer than E edges. Now let G be a connected planar graph on V vertices and E edges. The goal is to somehow find um, an an edge to remove while still maintaining being connected and planar and then trying to use induction on that smaller graph. But the problem is if you want to be still connected and planar, in removing edges, we can stay planar, but if we want to stay connected, we have to remove something that's not a bridge. We can do that um, in, in, in the fact, because of the fact that we're outside of the base case. Okay. So since the base case E equal to V minus one is established, we have E is greater than V minus one. So the graph we're starting with is not a tree. If it's a tree, it would have V minus one edges. Okay, now if it's not a tree, uh, we can say, therefore, <clears throat> 
has an edge that is not a bridge. Right? Or in other words, it lies on a cycle. We actually won't use the cycle part. We'll just use the fact that it's not our bridge. And we're gonna delete that edge. So now I wanna be careful. I'm gonna call this edge E prime. And the, the, the reason why I wanna be careful here is because E prime is not a number, it's an edge. All right, so I'll make that actually very explicit. Okay. So the graph we're going to consider the smaller that we'll use induction on is G delete E. So consider, or G delete E prime, sorry. So we'll consider the graph G prime, which is G delete E prime. So let's draw a picture to get a sense of what's going on here. So you have this connected planar graph G, right? And then you have this edge E prime in it. And there's all sorts of things going on with this graph, but it's connected and planar. So it'll have something like a, a face on one side of E prime and the face on the other side of E prime. Okay, now you've deleted it. And because this is now a graph on fewer edges than G, the same number of vertices, which we fixed, and we're inducting on the number of edges, we can make the assumption that G prime satisfies this Euler's formula if G prime itself is also connected and planar. We actually know it is connected and planar because of the following reasons. So since E prime is not a bridge, uh, G prime is connected. Okay. Now, why is it planar? Well, if you have a planar drawing of a graph and you want to find a planar drawing of that same graph where you delete an edge, just erase that edge from your original planar drawing of your original graph. Okay. Um, G, pri G prime is also planar. A planar... drawing can be obtained from a planar drawing of G by erasing E prime. Okay, so Since G prime has fewer edges than G, by induction, G prime satisfies Euler's formula. So now we need to know all these different pieces um, of how many edges uh, this particular graph has, how many vertices um, and faces. And then we can piece that together to figure out what we want from about G.
All right. So first of all, G prime has V vertices. V is the number of vertices of the original graph G. All we did is deleted an edge. So we did not actually change the number of vertices. It has E minus one edges because it is obtained from G by deleting one edge. And how many faces does it have? Well, G has F faces and we've deleted this one edge that has two faces on each side of it. So when we delete it, these two faces on each side merge into one face, right? And F minus one faces, and let's write a reason for this. Uh, the two faces of G on either side of E prime merge into one face. Now there's something very technical about this that we have to add in, which is it actually matters that E prime is not a bridge because it forces E prime to be on a cycle. Um, if we go back a few pages, we'll see where problems could lie depending on where you select E. So if you've selected your E prime, or E prime, sorry, if you selected your E prime to be this edge, for example, it is true that there are two faces on each side, but those two faces are the same face F2, right? And if you delete that, you unfortunately disconnect the graph. So there's something going on with like the fact that this has two faces, the same face on each side and the fact that it's a bridge. And we won't get to, into that technicality by just um, uh, picking this like the way that we did. Okay, so here are the number of vertices of G prime, here are the number of edges and here are the number of faces. So um, we'll iterate again by induction. Uh, the number of vertices in G prime minus the number of edges in G prime plus the number of faces in G prime is two. And now you can see this actually gives us the same result for G because the minus one and the plus one cancel out. So this again uses that paradigm that we've talked about before with inductive proofs. You have a theorem, it's a theorem about connected planar graphs, relating the number of vertices and edges and faces in a planar drawing. Right, you want to prove this thing for this big, for, for general graphs. Right, you find a smaller graph inside that satisfies the same properties, that's what we did right over here. The smaller graph was G delete E prime. Smaller meaning it has fewer number of edges in this case because we're inducting on the number of edges then we use the inductive hypothesis to say something about the, the relationship between the number of vertices edges and faces in that smaller graph and then we put that together to figure out what we wanted which was Euler's theorem for the larger graph g okay so this formula ends up being really really useful and we'll see in the next video how we can use Euler's formula to actually figure out inequalities between the number of edges and vertices that planar graphs must satisfy. And so if you violate those inequalities, you're forced to be not planar. And that certifies or is a way to certify that graphs are not planar.